The reading this morning is taken from Mark chapter 14, beginning at verse 53, and it's on page 1021 in the Church Bibles, if you'd like to look it up, otherwise it will be on the screen. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There, he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days will build another not made with hands. Yet even then, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Church warden, am I allowed to move this big button? Thank you. Let me say a short prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for those songs we've just been singing which have reminded us of the privilege uh, that you do indeed open your word to us and you change our lives and our hearts. We thank you for that fantastic gift. We ask that you'd help us to hear you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Firstly, quickly, the title that you've got on your sheets if you've noticed it, The King Condemned. Did it make you think, oh no, (laughs) Let me add to it. The king condemned is the king who will conquer. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it, the Undercover Boss program. Anybody? Just a wave of a hand. If somebody, oh, that's good. There are a few recognitions. Undercover Boss is a program that happens in three stages. Um, First, we hear about a company, uh, its progress and its problems, and we we meet the boss. Then the, the boss, disguised, goes among his employees who've been told that they are helping in a competition by assessing this stranger's ability and suitability to be selected for some big prize. Next, in disguise, the boss sees exactly what's going on. Right in his own company or her own company. And often, they receive unfiltered comments from the employees they meet. Sometimes those comments are about themselves. Finally, the employee or the employees are brought in supposedly to give their verdict to that same person that they have been judging. But they don't yet realize it. Now, when suddenly they have the shock of realizing that it is the very same person who is revealed to them, I thought your face looked familiar, but now you haven't got the purple hair or whatever it is. Now they receive the judgment from that boss. Some get rewards for their great work. Others get challenged 
and feel a bit edgy. That's the setup. Now, today, our passage is a tiny bit like that. It is a picture of Jesus. And what's important is that first, you and I get the full picture. We get the whole story and the context. Next, the true picture. And finally, carefully, I want us, I want you, to put yourself in the picture. The full picture, the background picture. Let me give you a quick whiz through where we've come in Mark's Gospel. Because it is important to grasp exactly what's going on at this moment in the passage that Jenny read for us. Jesus has been cheered as the king who comes. He comes in the name of the Lord. He's overturned the um, tables of the temple. He's overturned the tables of the traders who are polluting the sacred space in God's house. Mark chapter 11, verse 17, he says, My house will be called a house of, of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers. He says to those who are trying to prevent him doing what he's doing, to those who desecrate that place. He's told a story of tenants. Do you remember Alex uh, preached for us on that? A story of tenants in a vineyard who refused to pay rent to the owner. And they've tried to take over the whole vineyard for themselves by killing the owner's son. The listeners know that Jesus is deliberately identifying them, his listeners, as those bad tenants who are rebelling against the identity and the authority of God himself. We heard from uh, Dick just uh, last week, was it like whenever it was, uh, he um, outraged money-loving critics by approving of a woman who, in their view, wasted the value of a very expensive perfume by pouring it lovingly over the head of Jesus. Pouring it on his head. And then he said to her and to everyone listening that what she's done is a beautiful thing, anointing me to prepare my body for burial. Strange way to speak about such a thing. And now, just before our passage that we've heard this morning, now, as he had predicted... He has been betrayed by one of his closest followers for money and arrested. Interestingly, when they arrest him, he says with great irony, are you here for a robber? He said, you've made God's house a den of robbers. And then when they arrest him, he says, are you here for a robber? Really? Me? You think that's what I am? Even though I was in the temple teaching, teaching about God every day? Well, a lot of people, you see, have been really thrilled. You may have been thrilled to hear about the stories and the wonderful things that Jesus has done and said. They, many of them, were thrilled by all those things. But a significant number of powerful people, people who had a role in the way things worked, they were understood for their authority and their status and how well they did things and how impressive they were. A lot of powerful people have felt threatened by the attention this Jesus is getting and the public criticism that they have been getting in return. As far back as chapter 3, verse 6, if you want to look it up, the Pharisees and the Herodians were plotting to kill this Jesus. He's had opposition all the way along. And now here in chapter 14, verse 53, they took Jesus. They, that is the temple guard, having gone back to grab hold of him again, they took Jesus to the high priest. In 55, the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin, what were they doing? Looking, searching out, trying to find. What could they pin on him? Looking for evidence against Jesus. So that, is this the work of the high priest? Is this the work of someone's care and spiritual oversight of a member of their own people? Looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. It is manipulative. It's corrupt. It's corrupt especially because it's been 
prejudged, predecided what the outcome of this encounter will be. Even though they were going through the right motions of a court, they weren't exercising unconscious bias as they considered Jesus. No, it was blatant knowing bias to achieve their end to get rid of him. So we're on our way. Just notice quickly in verse 54, which we skipped over. You'll see it there. Though everyone had run away, all Jesus' followers and disciples had run away, as he had said they would, We nevertheless, at this moment, when Jesus is arrested in the courtyard of the high priest's house, where the court has hastily been assembled in the darkness in the nighttime, we see that Peter has come back again. He's nearby. He's in the neighboring entranceway. Why is he there? What's he trying to do? We'll catch up with him later. You see, these leaders, they had decided that their job, what was it? To ensure that Jesus would be overwhelmed and defeated as far as they were concerned, as far as their challenge from him was concerned, and that they would make him into an interesting footnote in history. Ironic, really, because the author of life can never be a footnote in his own writing, can he? They were looking for someone much more politically effective and impressive as their Messiah. I wonder if anybody here has uh, effectively made Jesus a footnote, an interesting footnote in their lives. A member of my own family did that. They said, yes, I, I used to be interested in that. The prayer book, the Bible, with the name in it and the date. But really, Jesus was just a footnote in their lives, and that was a deep tragedy for me to realize that. Verse 55 to 59. The whole Sanhedrin, the chief priests, the whole Sanhedrin, looking for evidence. We know that's what they were up to. And they gathered witnesses. Witnesses had been arranged to enable a a, a charge of speaking against the temple, perhaps. That would be useful because everyone understood the significance of the temple. To speak against it, to threaten to destroy it, well, that would bring a very serious charge and a sentence. They could certainly dispatch him with that kind of um, charge if it could stick. But it all fell apart because they said different things. They invalidated their credibility as witnesses and the legitimacy of legitimacy of their supposed evidence it made it not qualify it couldn't justify uh, as evidence they'd misquoted Jesus you see they'd got a sort of an idea but they hadn't really grasped it properly or even stated it clearly they couldn't make it stick so Jesus remained silent there's nothing to answer here he's not going to bother himself with something irrelevant in the way they stated it He's going to determine what he will say and when and about what. That's why you and I need to keep paying attention to that big picture and this particular scene within it, which is a crucial one. Without anything really going forward, the high priest himself seems to step into the picture. He comes into the scene. I hope you're picturing this. I hope you're seeing this picture as it shapes up. I hope you're not walking past in the gallery of the pictures of Jesus that you hold in your mind saying, I don't really want to look at that one today. No, stay with it. This is God's word to us, even this, at this moment. The high priest steps in. He wants to move things along and he goes for broke. He goes with the killer question that gets to the heart of things. Are you the Messiah? In other words, are you claiming to be that figurehead of power and liberation for the people of God that our prophets have so often spoken of? If he were to answer that positively, that could be sold to the Romans as as rebellion, another figure to keep a close eye on, to hold down and, and oppress. He continues the question, though, are you the son of the blessed one, which is, the way of saying, talking about God, but without actually directly using his name, because they were, 
are such holy, careful people and respectful. They didn't want to use the name of God carelessly. Are you the son of the blessed one? In other words, are you claiming for yourself a divine nature and relationship to God as your own father? Which is, of course, absurd and couldn't possibly be true. But if you dared to say it were true... When it wasn't, you'd be dishonoring the sole authority of God himself to declare such a thing. And that would be blasphemy and call for a death sentence. So if you answer that one in a certain way, that'll give us our way in in or out. There's the wider picture. There's the full big picture of everything that's been going on bringing us to this moment. Uh, Are you there with it? This This isn't just a little mini moment. This is part of the whole deal of how you and I understand and see clearly the picture of Jesus. We're going to get the inklings now of the true picture. Not just see the broad and see the moment, but get the true picture of it. In answer to these killer questions from the high priest, Jesus does not now stay silent. Now is the hour. Now is the time, Jesus had said. This is where everything comes to a crunch. The answer is, in fact, yes to both questions. But he goes even further. Verses 61 and 62 are absolutely astonishing. I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man, speaking of himself, as he often did use that phrase, but now giving it an even deeper meaning. You will see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the Mighty One, the right hand of the power. This is a reference to Psalm 110. A psalm well understood by his contemporaries to be about the true Messiah. And, as he continues, coming on the clouds of heaven. This is another important reference. Those who understood and knew their Bibles would definitely recognize this wasn't just an interesting picture, just a nice image. This was drawing on the prophet Daniel. Chapter 7, verse 13. Well worth going back to to have a glance at when you can. Uh, And the next couple of verses. Jesus is very deliberately telling them by making this answer and extending it very deliberately telling them and telling us that he is the fulfillment of the figure prophesied so many hundreds of years before by the prophet Daniel. And it means this in that context of Daniel. After four powerful rulers of earth, four empires, what is it, Persians, Babylonians, Romans, can't remember what the four are. But after these four great empires, God's ruler will come. And his rule won't be a messy, earthly kind of empire. But his rule will be over all things and for all time. Jesus is that person presented to God the Father, brought into his throne. You'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, being presented in the very center of the heavenly realms, presented to God the Father in such a way that we might be familiar with in the words of Philippians chapter 2. This ring a bell for you? Given the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Daniel 7 is effectively talking about a figure like that. Given a name by every name. Brought to the center of things. Jesus says, I'm going to be in the highest place. Everyone will discover I am the center of all things. Did you notice what you sang this morning? How great thou art. I see the stars. Thy power throughout the universe displayed Jesus is declaring, I'm going to be right there with the one whose power is displayed throughout the universe. That's where I'm going to be. That's where you'll see me. 
Now, those people then, and this people now, every single one of us, needs to live our lives with that in mind. That has to make a difference. In the Apostles' Creed, what do we say? Those of you who know the Apostles' Creed, who stand up and make your declaration of faith, what does it say? He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. We declare it. This, this thing that Jesus says at this moment, which is going to become very clear, we declare it as important part of what we believe. It's not just on the way to something else that's important. It is important in itself. That's what the ascension is about. And we know, don't we, that it did take place. Some 40 days after the resurrection had happened, after Jesus had been seen alive and talked with his disciples, then he ascended into heaven. There is no higher place of authority. In the answer to high priest's question, Jesus has brought the picture of himself now into a very sharp focus. It demands attention, it demands a judgment to be made. At this point, we move from the big picture, the true picture, the focus picture. What do we see? We find the person of Jesus. We should find the person of Jesus looking back at ourselves. And that my prayer is that that's what you will find too. And that you will meditate on that. That it will strike you. Jesus is looking back at you. He's the one in the highest place, with the greatest authority. Has the high priest put himself in the picture as he should? Will you put yourself in the picture, so to speak? But it's the picture, if you like, that Jesus is looking at, the picture of your life and your heart. This high priest on earth, in this moment that we come across in Mark... He is sitting as a judge in court on earth. He's doing it in the name of God. So it's a profound irony, isn't it? That when Jesus, the true high priest, our high priest, declares about himself that he is also God's appointed judge of all the earth, what is it that happens? This is like that program. The the shock of realization should be about to happen for that man and that court. What have we done? Who is it we're really dealing with? I hadn't seen it before, but now I have. Have you seen that? Did they see that? Well, look at verses 64 to 65. It turns out that this particular high priest turns out to be a tenant robber in God's vineyard who wants to get rid of the son for himself, he judges Jesus and condemns him as worthy of death, as do all the others. Now ask yourself, as you watch this true life crime drama and hear Jesus' clear answer to the charges against him and the questions and his affirmation, yes, this is me, Are you thrilled by him? Good. Are you threatened by him? Be careful not to quickly say no. Some of you need to say yes. uh, 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 That's right. That does challenge me to recognize Jesus as he really is. It isn't possible to remain neutral because of the claim Jesus makes. It's about universal role, uh, sorry, universal rule. And that means you live in the universe, don't you? There's no one here who's not living in the universe. That means it's for us. It's impossible to be detached from this question about the place of Jesus in our lives, over our lives, confronting our lives with his gaze. Any intellectual sophistication, worldly status, personal acquaintances or wealth or experience or even detailed knowledge of the Bible, none of that can protect you from the implications of the gaze of the living Jesus 
from his place of highest authority. Now we meet someone who hasn't grasped that yet, and he's the high priest. Every single person has to somehow come to terms with Jesus. Otherwise, your worldview is incomplete. Because of the claim Jesus made, you've either got to dismiss it completely or grasp it properly. He's made a claim. The high priest decisively rejects it. He declares his condemnation to enable him to arrange for the death penalty. That's what actually happens. He has to actually, oddly, go to a different worldly authority, to the Romans, for this execution penalty to be carried out. And in chapter 15, verse 1, off we go. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders and the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. It's rather ironic, isn't it? Let's underline the claim. Jesus knows who he is. We need to know who he is. The one who comes to the place of highest authority. The one who said his last words were, weren't they? All authority has been given to me. That's the one we're dealing with. Don't miss this challenge in verses 61 and 62. I keep losing sight of it myself, so do please have a quick look. Don't lose sight of it. Verse 62, I am, said Jesus, and you, all of you, will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, coming on the clouds of heaven. Some of them would literally see that moment of ascension. But these words are not just tied into that moment. They are here for all of us. You will all see. Jesus has directly applied what he's saying to his immediate audience. The high priest, the chief priest, the members of the Sanhedrin. He's explicitly put them in the picture. He's turned his gaze on them. And through this word of God, Jesus is turning his gaze upon you and me as well. Are you thrilled or threatened by him? as your prospective judge, because that's why he's up there on that throne. He will be the one who gives final judgment because of his authority, his purity, and his innocence. He is God's true representative. We should be a little bit threatened by that in one sense, because we are worthy of judgment and condemnation for our sinfulness. And I really do mean every single one of us. It's a terrifying thing in a way. It should be a terrifying thing to recognize this applies to every one of us, that the Son of Man, God's own Son, God's appointed one, will be your judge and my judge. There is no escape from that reality. And yet, do I want you to leave church terrified? Is that what I prayed for in preparing this? You'll be pleased to know it's not except in a certain kind of spiritual way because, and this is where Peter comes in, you see, God mercifully helps us deal with the prospect of such an authoritative, holy judge about whom we've said all the wrong kinds of things and lived in all the wrong kind of ignoring God ways that we often so much, uh, do so much. Peter is here to remind us. You see, he was nearby because... He was trying not to have deserted Jesus, perhaps. He was trying to hang on and say, I think I can do it. I, I, w- I won't leave you, even if all the rest do. I'll even die with you. And here he is, just at a little bit of a distance while this trial is going on. And a servant girl says, aren't you one of his followers? Aren't you aligned to him? Oh, no, no, I don't know. Yes, I'm sure you were. You were with him. You were one of those. No, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, yes, you were. He, you were one of them. I don't know this man. I don't know what you're talking about. See, we need to see that everyone is a deserter and a rejecter and a, a, a failure 
as regard to the right relationship with Jesus is concerned. We, we can't match up in any way. We certainly can't justify ourselves. But once we've understood that, what do we see? Jesus owned up to who he was at the moment of greatest threat to himself and his body. He faced his suffering on the cross. What a mighty, mighty saviour. Why do we do the saviour you are? You can wash away my sin. You can change my heart within. It's great, isn't, isn't that a fantastic thing? Be a bit frightened, but be thrilled if you are someone who's understood who Jesus is now. If you've had that conviction of your weakness and failure, you're in exactly the right place to say how wonderful that Savior came for me. What a relief to be able to say to God, thank you that you know me through and through. I don't have to hide or appear stronger than I am or holier than I am. We are weak when we think we're strong. We need Jesus who does not waver and is faithful in fulfilling the Father's will to redeem lost sinners, lost sheep. So will you make sure you've got the picture right? Peter had to do that. Jesus is on trial, owning up to who he is, and yet he's condemned for blasphemy. Peter's outside, failing to own up to who he is, and yet he's the very one for whom, the likes of whom Jesus came. Will you rejoice in that? If you haven't understood who Jesus is, take a fresh, hard look at that picture. Ask someone else to help you do it. Look in detail. Don't assume you know it. Don't misquote him. Ask God to lead you to see clearly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to us. Please teach us. Please encourage us when we feel weak and lost. Please challenge us when we think we know what the score is, but we haven't seen properly. But thank you for your great mercy that we need not come with fear unless we choose to reject you or belittle you. We can come with great confidence because of your great love. And we thank you for that in his name. Amen.